Hi guys, welcome to episode three of Books with Jen. If you are watching slash listening to this on YouTube and you'd like to download an audio file of this podcast to listen while you're out and about, there's a link in the description or you can just go to jen-campbell.com forward slash podcast. So this, as I said, is episode three and I've got two fantastic ladies um, to chat to you guys today or for you guys to listen to today as I chat to them. Uh, The first one is Janet Ellis. Um, She has just written a novel called The Butcher's Hook, which came out in February this year and is just, I loved it so much. I gave it five stars and after I'd finished reading it, I quickly emailed Janet and was like, can I come talk to you about this? Because I kind of fell in love a bit and she said yes. You might know Janet um, outside of her writing for being a Blue Peter presenter. She's also an actress, she's been in Doctor Who and she's also Sophie Ellis Bex's mum. So that is the first interview that we're going to and after that we're going to talk about women and comics. But first off, over to Janet Ellis. Hey everyone, I am here in Janet Ellis's kitchen and she's, she's fed me cake. She's fed me cake and her beautiful dog Nancy is here. I'm not going to make Nancy say hello to you, but she is lovely. <laughs> Hi, Janet. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Also, Nancy may just sort of jingle her collar and generally sigh. Yeah, <laughs> so that's what it is. That is what it is. Oh, oh yes. there, you go. there you go. There we there go. go. There we go. Yeah. There we go. That's she's very, very nice of you to stroke her like that because I know she's not clean. Oh, that's thank clean. you for the, for the warning after <laughs> I've. <laughs> okay, Janet. So your book came out. Your first book. Your first book a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. How, how does it feel now that it's out in the world? Very nervous making. It's it's a relief too because the, you know I've got three children and this was the longest pregnancy by far. <laughs> I felt I was carrying that book really until elephant style, style gestation. Mm. But um, now that it's out, it's a combination of things really. First of all, I can't do anything about what happens next. No. But also, whatever happens next, I've got a book there. And because it's my first, you know, I'm hugely proud of the way it looks, yep, it's it beautiful. feels, it smells nice. It and yeah, whatever happens to it next, and obviously we, we may talk about this, you know, I'm sure most writers, especially new ones, go through the same trajectory of it doesn't matter what happens. And then you realise it does kind of matter what happens. You want people to read it, ideally enjoy yeah. it too. But ultimately, ultimately, the biggest thing is there's a book. Yeah, well, I absolutely loved it. Oh, thank and I'm not you. just saying that because you gave me cake. Because I loved it before you gave me cake. <laughs> well, I have some so. more cake. I will have some more cake. <laughs> we'll get into the, without spoilers, into it in a minute. But I think I said it was delightfully grotesque. <laughs> I love it because you're in the, the mind of the main character, Anne Jacob, and she just gets more and more just away from where she started from. And I, I loved it. It kind of reminded me slightly of The Dumb House by John Burnside. You guys will know that I rave about that book, but it's not as it's not quite as twisted as that book, but it does get quite twisted. So you said this has been a long period, like working on it and mm-hmm. waiting for it to come out. When did you start writing it? Actually, it's not that long since I started working on it. Mm. When I applied to the Curtis Brown course, and I, I've said this before, I'm... <laughs> Bigged up that course so much, and I want my money back. <laughs> but I am very grateful to them. But I applied because you had to have 3,000 words with these rather strange 3,000 words, which is pretty much the first chapter mm. and a synopsis, which I didn't have, so I made something up. But I didn't have any more than that. And and it was such a strange thing that when we started on the course, and we were sitting, there were 14 of us, we were sitting around the, the big table in the boardroom, introducing ourselves and saying what our books were about and how much we had and I was kind of one of the last to go and I kept thinking I realized as we went around the table everybody's going well I've got you know 120,000 words I've got three (laughs) (laughs) but actually there were a couple of others who were at starting points which was great and the idea of that course was to help you shape how you thought your novel would be and obviously all the other nuts and bolts of the craft Mm. but um, that's when I started it really two years ago and by the time I left the course I had about 6,000 words, but not much more. But an agent as well. Which well, that is definitely fantastically a big lucky. step. Yeah. Absolutely. So how how much writing had you done before you attempted this novel? Because I know that you've written... Nothing that. like... I'd never finished a book before. No. Actually, that's not true. I, re- I finished a book when I was 10. That was Pips. I wrote The Music Box. Although I think I rushed the ending. I had a really supportive teacher, Mr. Wayne. And I don't know what happened to him. Because I was in army school, so we moved a lot. Mm. But he... 
when I was writing, you know, whatever they were, little stories at the end of the day, like you could, you know, said to me, write it, write all the time, just keep writing, and sort of gave me the freedom of the stationery cupboard, which was a big deal. That is a big deal. Yeah, have a book, you know, just without it being connected to any subject. So I did write a book then, but yeah, since then, I've I've started things and I've abandoned them. I've written sections of things like a weird mood board of thinking at some point I want this scene in a book somewhere. But for all sorts of reasons, not, not many of which are very flattering to me, I just hadn't got a book done at all. But, I mean, writing is, is terrifying, isn't it? Because yeah. you're thinking, right, so I have this idea, kind of, <laughs> and it's half formed in my head, kind of, yeah. and I'll start writing it, and I might work on it for years, and then it might not go anywhere. And, and, and if it does, people might hate actually, it. actually, isn't it? Well, the more I talk about it, the more I think you've got this weird thing where... You write something down, and you don't just think, right, that's written down. You think, I'll oh, just show it to some people. <laughs> I mean, is, you know, obviously, as, as, as an actress and as a presenter, I'm used to that. But that's been a transference of other people's words, mm. you know, working from scripts or even, even when you're filming and it's your own words, you're still communicating something. But the book is just communicating you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm. And the more you yeah. talk to yourself about it, the yes. more it doesn't seem to make sense in your head absolutely, anymore. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. No, definitely, of, of all my careers, <laughs> the most <laughs> frightening. My, my husband is, is the worst sort of critic because he just thinks it's all brilliant, which is lovely. That's nice too. Though. It is nice, but, but I knew it wasn't. You yeah. Know, realistically, even I knew it wasn't. And I, I hadn't really been brave enough to show much to people because I had struggled for so long with not being able to hear past, well, this is going in the right direction, but the minute they said but, I either thought, I'm an idiot, or occasionally, they are. Well, yeah. n- none of which was conducive to actually yeah. hearing. And so I think when I started that course, one of the things I thought was, just listen when people say something. Just listen. Don't dis- Even if it's going off on a tangent, just listen, because that's good practice for all the other listening you'll have to do. Yeah. And actually, I think that above everything is what I got out of it. You know, just the ability... If somebody said, I'm not sure that she would have, you know, rather than thinking, you're an idiot, I created, you know, and actually thinking, you're right. And if more than one person says it, they're definitely right. Yeah. You know, if, if they agree on something that you've done and it's, it's a, a possible to do it again. That's the other thing I didn't really trust. I thought, oh, you know, if I had to do it again, I'll lose everything. I'm, mm-hmm. Whatever that is, it'll go. And actually, of course, you know, I now know the other side of it. A lot of that has to happen to make a book. Yeah, absolutely. That. So let's talk about the idea for the book. Where did that come from? <laughs> it came from her voice. I think when I wrote this strange thing, and I, obviously at that point I had no idea where it was going to go, um, I just sat upstairs and started this weird thing of first person and in the present tense narrative of somebody in this unhappy household. There's a new baby born, but she doesn't like it. She's lost her little brother. And so I knew at that point, that it wasn't contemporary. But I wasn't quite sure, until I really refined it, what period I was going to set it in. Mm. Sort of had a vague thing that it might be Elizabethan. And I thought, actually, I need something a bit more... I don't know what the expression is, but a bit more woken up than that. You know, a bit more present for me, mm. because... You a know, bit more grounded. You, in yeah, and also yeah. visible, because if you if you live in London... Georgian England got a bit swamped by, you know, its its noisy great-granddaughter of the Victorian era because that kind of built everything and, and dictated to us a lot of the way we live. But if you live in London, it sort of winks and waves at you, doesn't it, Georgian mm-hmm. England? You can sort of, yeah, that's, oh, that's beautiful, that's really lovely. And I don't know whether there was, you know, a, a Prince Charles naysayer about that architecture, but I've never heard tell of it. Everybody seemed to really approve of these lovely buildings going up. And it was the first time that more people lived in towns than in the country. And it was the beginnings of communication, although obviously nothing like as, as vast as we have. But something about it, I just thought there's a, there's a sense of, of a spring, you know, something mm-hmm. waking up. Whereas when I think of Elizabethan England, I think of something quite closed and difficult and, and obviously historically so mired in stuff. Whereas the specific year I'm writing about, nothing much happened. Which was it is, 1763? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, because nothing much happened. <laughs> I'm going to put it in the middle of the things. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, because you want it to be its own story and yes. not too much in Absolutely, like yeah. My, my characters happen in front of history, but they're not making it, that's for sure. And I... I knew that if, you know, I'm the same, you know, if I read something and it misses out a big battle or that terrible illness or something, you thought, well, where was that? You know, surely they would have heard about it. So, yes, I needed it. I needed it as a backdrop. But I'm so obsessed with the fact that 
people were the same then, even mm. if they did wear different clothes and couldn't get an Uber or didn't have an Oyster card. You know, they still felt things in the same way. They fell in love and they were greedy and tired and sorrowful and, uh, and angry in the same way as us, mm. just looking different about it. So can you set the scene for us? We've got Anne Jacob. Mm-hmm. She's 19 when she's She's 19, 19 yes. Which I think, um, from what I know of that time, is, is quite quite an odd thing because old enough to be married off mm. but still immature in that her life experience was woefully small. You know. well, she was just never exposed to other children either, no. was she? No. Apart from her siblings who kept dying. Yes, exactly. <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> yes, and it, it, it's odd because I, I knew very early on that, that she wasn't going to be a mournful, sad mm. little girl, that there was a big spirit there and uh, and a sideways look on life because my favorite people have that you know they kind of they're wry about things Mm. and they you know they don't always speak what's in their heads but you know there's lots going on (laughs) so yes it's in an unhappy household her her father is uncaring I mean they're all actually grieving the death of this adored little boy who died some years earlier and the mother keeps on having miscarriages trying for this other child but even the birth of this child because it's another girl so obviously no cause for celebration and and it's almost as though the adults in the in the household have become unused to anything except grief. Mm-hmm. So when they're not feeling sad, they're just tired. Yeah. They just have that weariness of life and difficulty. So you've got this young girl who is full of spirit and with everything still in front of her, stuck and really stuck. Because that's the other thing I, I got really, really vividly from that time is that your four walls were pretty much all you saw quite a yeah. lot. You know, you couldn't get out easily. You could, you were free to walk about, interestingly enough. You didn't have to be chaperoned everywhere except you were likely to meet a chap. But even so, you know, there, there wasn't um, interaction. You didn't really see your peer group much if you lived in that sort of household. And even if you did, your future was mapped. You know, she's from a, quite a well-to-do family, so... The understanding is she will marry well, you mm. know, and at some point, as happens in the book, your your future husband, rather alarmingly, will be presented to you. Which... The future <laughs> husband person mm. reminded me of Mr. Collins a lot. Was that deliberate, do you think? I, I think he's everybody, isn't he, oh, like he that? It, he's everybody that, you know, you kind of, I don't know, sit next to uh, on the bus or at a dinner party. And, and wish you were uh, uh, Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, yes. And yet... This character, um, Onions, is sort of Teflon coated. He just thinks he's fab. Whatever happens, whatever obstacle he meets, whatever um, antipathy, he just kind of thinks he's better than that. And so, I love that name, Onions, as well. <laughs> it is a fantastic yeah, I don't know. name. We do have a friend called Pickles, and maybe I was inspired by the fact that it's possible to be called Pickles. Yeah. But <laughs> it's not based on him. <laughs> well, no, that would, that would be the end of your friendship. It would be, I think, yeah, the beginning was. of a lawsuit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what I love about Anne as well is that she... As you said, she has her four walls and those mm. are the only worlds she knows. But when she steps out of that into other worlds, she acts like she owns them, even mm. though she doesn't. <laughs> like when she has her first friend who comes around, daughter of um, one of her dad's uh, like work people, mm. and she says very confidently, I'm going to make you a necklace. <laughs> and she takes a strand of her hair and puts spit along as if it's pearls and puts it around her own neck. And she's so appalled. And she's like, what did I do? I like, thought that was acceptable. Is it yeah. not? Yes, and you're in the wrong for not liking that, my gift to you. I thought, I thought all you'd want to do is make me one, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, so she's definitely standing for me in terms of bravery. Because, mm. yeah, I, I couldn't... I mean, obviously, later on, she her moral compass gets a bit skewed. But even so... Uh, her kind of attitude to it and her self-possession really fascinated me that I could write that because that isn't really me and I'm sure it isn't most of us you know Mm. just finding that we're at ease in the world even if we don't have any experience of it It certainly wasn't my teenage (laughs) years so after you had written the beginning of the book the first 3,000 words that you took to the, Mm. the course were they what ended up obviously not in the same form but was that still the beginning of the story yes it was yes yeah it was yeah and then, who was your agent? You said you left found, having found one. Yes. I'm assuming it was at Curtis. Yes, it was actually. Um, and and I, I like that it's a sort of fairy story, really, because obviously, on the course, uh, we heard a lot of what won't happen. You know, which is that you won't get an agent till you finished a book, and even then, you know, it's very hard to find one because you've got to find. And I know from my other careers. I've got loads of agents. You know, there's always a right one for you, and they may not necessarily be the right one for somebody else. So I thought, well, that's fair enough. Mm. 
On the other hand, we were all sitting within Curtis Brown, which is also a confident world. So there was a kind of, you know, listen, this is the best agent. Yeah. <laughs> of course, this is best. But it won't necessarily be your agent. However, it is the best. But at the end of the course, we were invited, in inverted commas, to submit, again, the 3,000 words, which by then had been workshopped, so, mm-hmm. you know, quite usefully um, tidied up. Uh uh, kind of around the agency j- just to get a bit of feedback if possible and there was absolutely no guarantee that we would get feedback but I I then had a letter from from the chap who not surprisingly now represents me because it's the letter I would have written to myself basically it was enormously nice and um <laughs> and funny enough I, a, a friend of mine I won't name who is a writer I rang her and I said oh my god it's the most amazing thing. You know, it really is very story I've just had the most you know I've only got this chapter and he doesn't know that. Um, but I, you know, I've had this wonderful letter offering to represent me. And obviously I have to go and explain that there isn't a book and he might change his mind mm-hmm. after that. But, um, you know, and she said, well, you know, if you've had that reaction, then obviously you should wait. You know, obviously you should, you know, see what happens because there'll be other agents. But I kind of had a feeling about this. And obviously I was th- absolutely thrilled and overexcited. But even so, I just thought, quite apart from the hyperbole, you know, there's something in the fact that he's got Anne, you know, mm-hmm. he, he's heard her and and i I don't know whether I'm I'm sort of um ultra nervous about this, but I thought actually what I quite like is he's a bloke as well. Yeah. <laughs> because you know, I I think when I'm reading the last thing I think of is the sex of the writer unless the, unless it's all over the place and, and you're meant to. But th- there is something very satisfying when all sorts of people of all ages and all genders like your work. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it does it does have for me, anyway, you know, I just thought that's great because I want to be able to give this to my son and his yeah. friends as well as my daughters and my friends and, you know, and, and have a, a reasonable ambition that at least they'll read it even if they don't like it. But, um, no, it was great. So I did go to see him and explained, <laughs> confessed. And that was J- July of, yeah, the year before last. Mm. And, and he said to me, that's okay, you know, go and write your book. When can you, when can you hand it to me? I, um, November, because that sounded wow. like far <laughs> enough away. And actually, I did. Yeah. I did, yeah. Well, actually, when you've got that deadline, and if you know that it's oh, going somewhere... I'm all about a deadline, yeah. 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 yeah, are you yes, like that? I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just sort of had to have that, really. And I know in terms of, of the outside world, you know, a book deadline does not involve, you know, that the, the illness gets worse or, mm. you know, the, or the child becomes too old. But, you know, and you can change it and go past it. But there's something about having that fixed point yeah. which was really important to me. So, yeah, I handed him 85,000 words. And, of course, by, you know, he didn't know the story. He'd just seen this first bit. And we decided between us that we wouldn't... I wouldn't just give him bits piecemeal. You mm. know, I said, I'll just give you the watch. And... I have to say, in terms of, you know, all the other bits which have been <laughs> edge of the seat, waiting to hear back from him about if he liked the story was massively difficult. Just refreshing your emails casually every five seconds. Yeah, and actually I gave it to him on a Friday because that was the day I'd chosen and then, of course, spent the whole weekend thinking, what did he think? And he emailed me on the Monday and said, you probably imagined I've spent the whole weekend, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just about to, but you still won't hear back from me, which is actually really good. <laughs> Yeah. What an idiot, of course. Well, no, yes. but it's, it's your baby. You, I know. Uh, so, yeah, I was actually, um, it was the middle of December, and I was doing, <laughs> this is so random, um, I'm a patron of Maggie Centres, mm-hmm. and uh, charities get the occasional chance to have their carol concerts at St Paul's Cathedral. So we were doing that, and I was speaking on behalf of Maggie's, and I was in this little vestry, uh, there was no... Daylight on the magic. There's no dressing rooms in churches. So I was in this little vestry, actually with, with Soph, who was singing at it. And I got this message just before I turned off my phone. Mm-hmm. And it was just from, from Gordon, just saying, read it, loved it. And honestly, I, d- I don't think it's got better than that, in a way. Because otherwise, it would have been back to square one. You yeah. know, if he'd said, the story doesn't work, you know. And then, from then on, it was just building blocks. But that was easily the loveliest thing to read that it's great it's that, that yeah no I can, I can, yeah. I can even the look on you can't <laughs> see David's face right now but with the remembering yeah. and I imagine you went out there and the best carols ever yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Also, I was sitting next to um, Dominic West on one side and Simon Callow on the other. So pretty, pretty smart evening. Pretty smart. Pretty Absolutely. smart. <laughs> so I've read in uh, the interview that you did in the bookseller that you and your agent decided to send out the book without your name on it. Yeah, yeah. That, that was his idea, although it's a good one, so I'm going to claim it. No, okay, it was, that's it was, fine. That was definitely his claim idea. <laughs> and initially, when he suggested it, I was really horrified because I thought, you know, for the first time in my life, I've written a book. Why would I not want everyone to know this? But but he, of course he was right in that I'm not daft, I'm not sort of super mega famous, but on the other hand, things I've done in the past have a kind of oh yes quality to them, you know, Blue Peter, oh yes, you're not oh yeah. You know, you might need to be reminded. Yeah. And, and obviously with Sophie's career, there's a kind of, you know, Sophie, she was, oh yeah. So, you know, I was aware of that. And also that all those things have strong associations and they're probably not the book. Mm. And he said the book stands on its own, so let's send it out on its own. And actually now, of course, that again, it's like his, his email, it's the fact I hugged to myself, because I think just for those few days, it was, it was just the book and yeah. my grandmother's name. <laughs> And a secret that you and yes. your agent were sharing. And that he had faith in it, not that he just loved it, but loved it enough yes. to send it out yeah. with yeah. my name on yeah. it. Yeah. He, he, I have to say he's gone past the, the, the gushing of the first email. I've never seen that in his eyes again. I've never heard anything like it. He's gone back to fairly morose. Mm -hmm. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what agents are like. That's what mine is like. Is it? Yeah, if is Charlie's listening, I do love you, Charlie. But yeah. yeah. And it's the funny thing, isn't it? Because my other agents are really quite enthusiastic you know you're gorgeous you're the best even if nothing happens you're lovely but but book agents are a bit mm, well okay but you know there's lots of other brilliant writers <laughs> not that you're brilliant <laughs> so you signed with two roads mm -hmm. and you signed for two, two books. books yes so how far are you into the second one right now well i'm i've 20,000 words i better stop saying that because i have been saying that for quite a long time i think i need to get those people out of that room now um, I have, I was warned about this, that I would be taken up with doing stuff for The Butcher's Hook, which mm -hmm. I have to say is in no way onerous mm -hmm. and actually quite delightful. But now that it's settling down to the book is out there yeah. and I'm just going to go and say hello to every festival that ever <laughs> wants me to go. And in between whiles, I'm going back to my people because that's what I felt with, with The Butcher's Hook, that... I'm I'm not someone who adores the research. I, you know, I do the research I need to do so that nobody stubs their metaphorical toe on wrongness. But I just want to get back to the people. I want to move them. How about. do you do the research because it is historical? Do you write and leave gaps and put notes for yourself saying I need to look at yes. this more, or do you do the research first and that inspires ideas? Both, actually, mm -hmm. um, because you know I'd written the sentence and you know there's the butcher's boy. I thought, why did I do that? I don't know anything about butchers. Mm -hmm. So then I had to go and do some. I went to the worshipful company of butchers, <laughs> and I say their library is not not brilliantly curated. I didn't necessarily find out all the answers to the things I thought I needed to know, but I found loads else. Mm. And yeah, I think even if you, you know, sometimes it's just chucking in a line, isn't it, that you just think that's such a, an amazing fact. I don't want to write a paragraph to explain it, mm. because my people know that's what happens. But uh, yeah, sometimes I, I deliberately thought I'm, I'm just, you know, for what she's wearing, that kind of thing. I hang around in the V&A, have a good look, see how difficult it would have been to get in and out of those clothes, you mm. know, because they're awkward and stiff and fiddly and you know they're not they're not just slip on slip off and I'm convinced that you know walking around London for a day then you would have had mud up to <laughs> six inches above yeah. your hem you know the place was the place was filthy every contemporary diarist or visitor always writes about how mucky London was and the smell of it so that's difficult to get away from. Well, I love that you focused on 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 butchers though, and that Anne was fascinated with the, like, the grime mm. and everything. When her family are trying to elevate her and yes. trying to marry her into yes. like a really nice family, she's like, "No, yeah. I like blood and guts. Yeah. Thank you very yes. much." What was your decision to involve a, a butcher instead of another profession? I, maybe it was that. I mean, I, I have to, I have to say I can't I can't completely remember. I think it was just somebody who would come to the house because mm. obviously that's how they needed to meet. And I just thought much more interesting if he's dealing in this sort of really literally visceral stuff, you know, that isn't neat, that raw doesn't smell great. You know, the baker would have been a very different proposition, oh, you yeah, know, nice and flowery and, you know, warm and cosy. But actually, you know, I, I was fascinated by the idea of all these people wandering around the streets with all this stuff. I mm. mean, it must, it must have been chaos. Apparently in those days, you could walk from one side of the Thames to the other on boats. It was so 
ran. Close together. They were so close together. And the streets too, obviously there were carriages, there were people on horseback, but the the actual volume of traffic in the streets. Mm. And then you've got people trying to sell stuff meanwhile. So yeah, the, the absolute confusion and chaos of it. And the fact that, yeah, he's dealing in something which is obviously um, a needful death. Mm. And as things progress for Anne, I, I would say she completely justifies what she does. You know, she, she stays her hand if it doesn't serve a purpose. So that what happens to people who get in her way, she thinks, is absolutely right. Mm. Um, and in the same way with, with the calf that she watches being slaughtered, she can see the point to it. But when she sees the bear baiting at the fair, there's no point to that. No. It's an uneven contest. It serves no purpose. So she's squeamish. So it's a, it is quite an odd mix. But I suppose part of that is when, when I was um, in my teens, I had a sudden craze for reading a lot of true life crime. Mm. Uh, you know, accounts of things like the Boston Strangler. And uh, obviously <laughs> something rubbed off. But equally... <laughs> It, it's the, and I'm hardly the first person to point that out, but the, the sort of banality of it and the fact that those people did horrific things and then went and bought a newspaper. You know, the guy buying, who was selling the newspaper would always say afterwards, seemed like a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> so it's that, how we walk side by side, not just with our own possibilities, but with the possibility that everyone in the street has those thoughts too. And yeah. I, I, I sort of think we do. I think we do. And Anne is surrounded by men who always justify mm. their actions and feel like they don't have to yeah. explain themselves to her because, and they can just do. Yes. Yeah. Um, so she's emulating that. She's, mm. she's taking that mm. on herself. I admire it very much, as much as I don't agree <laughs> exactly. with all the stuff that she did. Same, yeah. Um, so, for your next one, is that also historical fiction? Well, it's set in the 1970s, so of course to me that's not. No. <laughs> but I understand. <laughs> Many people will feel it is. But but actually that's because um, it, it's all set in, in Kent as well, where I lived briefly as a, as a child. And it's the first time I could really remember living somewhere properly because we moved a lot and we were in army quarters and in Kent my parents had bought a house so I had my own bedroom. And actually it's about it's about a, an adult woman and her, her teenage daughter. But it's it's also the time in my life I can remember most clearly. I think like most teenagers, you know, you have that um, thing that the whole world is about you. Yes. And, and you've just discovered sex for the yes, first time and no one else has ever absolutely. discovered that no, ever. Uh, and all the other stuff, you know, you... When I look at my diaries, I kept a diary between the ages of about sort of 8 and 16. Oh, never look back at those. Oh. Or at least don't let anyone else look at them. Well, I should have, I should have kept them to myself because <laughs> really, what a boring little sound But also, you know, there's great world events happening on mm. stage in the 60s and 70s. And I don't really mention them. They get a bit of a nod. <laughs> no, is Helen Cotton finally going to turn up for choir practice? Oh, a man lands on the moon. Pretty much. You know, it's really, it is extraordinary. Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yes. <laughs> But also, I can see when I'm, when I'm writing that, that it's the only time I write for some unknown future. Mm. You know, somebody reading it, that, you know, I'm, I'm actually present and watching something happening. You know, oh gosh, today we went decimal. What an amazing day this is, you know, winks at the future. But actually, most of it is completely concerned with day-to-day Mostly very dull stuff. But Do you still remember in my writing head. those? Because I used to have a diary. Did and you? I remember, but I didn't, I was never that good at keeping it. But it was, I always felt for me, and I'm sure it's not like this for other people too, but that it was quite fake for me. I was very conscious of everything I was writing in case anyone wanted to discover it, but future me could look back on it and think, oh wow, yes, yeah, she did like some stuff that day. And I would read it back yeah. later thinking, that's not what happened then. Oh, Do you no, know what I mean? I wish mine was that inventive. It's just really dull. Went for coffee, you know, chosen. It's really boring. Yeah, with occasional, you know, as it builds up. Because obviously I stopped writing a diary when things got differently interesting. <laughs> As it's building up towards that, you can mm. definitely see something of my heart in it. Something of, I hope he's there and I hope I see him. All about that sort of thing. Yeah. But so I were can, you using those diaries as, as not, reflections for your next novel? I think, I, I think I'll use bits. I, think I'll, they're, I know where they are. Mm-hmm. I think I'll just go back and have a look on certain days. Because... Because it isn't me, and because the character is, the the main character is a lot more timid, certainly, than Anne, mm. and a lot more at the whim of circumstance and her own feelings than Anne is. So, yeah, and she's not quite me either. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's fascinating to read, and obviously if there are any world events I can drop in, but... 
chance will be a fine thing finding them. <laughs> but that's also a good thing, though, if you're worried about, you know, when you're talking about wanting to include historical mm. events. But if you are writing about young people, they don't always notice that stuff. No, so it terrible. Wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be in a book anyway. No, quite. quite. No. Yeah. You would just get that it would be one of those questions at the end of a book signing. Yeah. Like, Excuse me. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. And, <laughs> and if, if I had missed anything like that, I would be saddened. So I did, I did make sure, as far as I'm aware, nothing happened in 1763. Mm. Because I didn't want that. I didn't want somebody saying, I just can't believe that they weren't worried about conscription for the ex war or you know the whatever it is and and i suppose you know things i found fascinating like the like the um the jacobite soldier who's wandering around and oh, in, yes. in in scotland then you were banned from wearing tartan mm-hmm. and obviously that pervaded a bit through so that people were just derised and awful they were treated so badly they were pretty much stateless you know they were given odd jobs to do but not really looked after at all so that idea, that's really vivid, and yeah, and seeing the other representations of that, you know, the only the only thing that Anne's got to go on are those really glorified, you know, often mixed with blood red images of battles, usually victorious, and you know, she she when she meets someone who's actually sort of cast down by it, uh, again, it's a kind of education in the fact that history isn't always telling the truth. Mm. I like that a lot. I do. And a question that I ask everyone: What's the last book you read and loved? Um, the last book I read and loved. Well, actually, I, I just read *The Widow*, which I really loved. Yes. I, yeah, because I'm, I'm actually. Uh, this is really one season. I'm doing an event with Fiona Barton in Scarborough, <laughs> and um, uh, in and in a couple of weeks' time. And I thought I I don't read many thrillers. Mm. Um, hands up, and I really enjoyed it. So yeah, that's good. And before that, I read a fantastic book called um, uh, *God's Own Country*. Ross Raisin. You read oh, that I haven't one? read that one. Oh. No wonderful book again it's just I just find it I know this is a really crass thing to say but I just find it extraordinary that all the same words are available to everyone and yet people will put them in a different order and have a completely different effect and his use of language is extraordinary it's it's a kind of vernacular through it because it is all set my husband's from from Huddersfield anyway so it's an area that I know and those moors which are they're beyond bleak, even if they have no connotations with unpleasantness, they are difficult. Mm. You know, they're, they're hard, even on a sunny day, they don't give you much, they don't give you much shelter. And when the when the weather changes there, it's unremittingly hard, but rewarding. You know, it's, it's um, having spent time out there, it is lovely to not feel you're more important than the landscape. Mm. You know, there's no markers, there's no kind of, uh, you know, very little to give a walker where they're going and it's You're great there. yeah pretty real but that was that that's everything oh. thank you very much guys please go and read the butcher's hook i think it's absolutely wonderful and i'd also recommend the audiobook i actually listened to the audiobook did you and then bought the book because i want to read it but i love the audiobook and uh, janet does the book oh well, that's really nice because i great. i was um without wishing to sound disingenuous i didn't want it never occurred to me to do it obviously you know i'm drastically trained but it, i didn't you know when when the i obviously i knew that an audiobook would happen and when when we were talking about it i had a wish list of mm, actresses people. yeah mainly because they were all so fab and i thought they could be my friend i could just <laughs> go along and watch them do a bit and then have coffee but uh, apparently they're all busy and then <laughs> when when my editor said you read it you know i had normally i say yes to things really quickly it's how i've kept any sort of career going but i did have a moment of thinking I don't hmm, you know that the character is morally ambiguous she's obviously 19 and I'm obviously not that you know there's a lot I've invested in her which I don't know whether I want any complication then I got over myself <laughs> and read it actually it was very I mean apart from being knackering extraordinarily tiring three days reading aloud it was also a brilliant way of just reminding myself of next time, don't use that phrase. Don't, you know, just, I read a lot aloud anyway when mm. I'm writing, obviously all dialogue, but even so, descriptive passages, because I have a bit of a thing about repetition of words. I don't like to do it. There's loads and I want to get the right one. But I just found a couple of places where I had, I'm not going to point them out. Just like anything. get a pen and be like, oh. really much. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, as an outsider, I didn't notice that when I was okay. reading it. It's just in your head. Don't worry about it. And I think the the, the phrase, everything is so... Because there are a lot of similes. There are a lot of metaphors. There are a lot of everything that Anne sees. She's like, this is like something that... Mm. It, she grounds it in something she knows. I think it just works absolutely beautifully. Well, that's so nice. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. Very, it's very absolutely chuffed. truthful. Thank you very much. And then let me know what you think. Yes, absolutely. See, I can tweet, take criticism now. Tweet her. Yeah. You're Miss Janet Ellis, aren't you? On I am, tweet yeah. Tweet her. Yes. Thank you. As I said, I think that you guys will really, really love The Butcher's Hook. So let me know if you do pick it up. Now I have an interview with Holly Burrows, who works at the House of Illustration, which is um, a small gallery in Granary Square next to King's Cross Station in London. And they are the hub of children's illustration and also general illustration and graphic novels. And I think they're a really fun gallery to go and explore. And at the moment, they have an exhibition on called 100 Women in Comics, which looks at female comic artists throughout the past several hundred years and their influence on art and on society and the stories that they are telling. I went to see the exhibition a couple of weeks ago and absolutely loved it and got in touch with Holly and asked if I could come and have a chat with her about it. So here we go. Hi guys, I'm here with Holly who works at the House of Illustration. Hi Holly. Hiya. Hiya. Can you tell us about when did the House of Illustration open? How long have you guys been here for? When next to King's Cross by the way in London. Yeah, we opened our doors in um, July the 2nd, 2014. So you're quite new. Quite new, yeah. yeah so um, And existed as an organisation for a bit longer than that. But that was the July was when we finally had a home where we could actually house some exhibitions. Um, and it's the hub of everything to do with illustration. Mm. So it's a place where you can come to find out about all kinds of different illustration and engage in talks, workshops, masterclasses, anything and everything. It's basically want. just art lover's dream. Maybe, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what are some of your favourite <laughs> exhibitions that you've had before the one that's on at the moment? Um, the one that I always find myself returning to is the Matt Connor exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, so Matt Connor was a sort of Mad Men era um, illustrator who worked mainly in advertising. And the reason that I really liked it was because his illustrations were incredibly beautiful, amazing colours, amazing draftsmen. But the thing that made it really special was each image told a story. So you'd only see this one image, but you'd immediately be asking, what's going on in this picture? Why mm. is that person looking at that person in that way? And often they were to illustrate stories. So it was obviously a way that would grab a reader and draw them in to actually read the whole story to see what's awesome. going on. Yeah. So what, well, you mentioned workshops and stuff. So what, what kind of things have you got going on at the moment? Um, coming up. Yeah, we've got lot well we do things for families and for adults as well. So we've got our master classes, some of which go on over several weeks. There's um one which I think actually has just sold out, which is children's book illustration. Mm. Um I know that there's a manga workshop for teenagers, which sounds really exciting. That sounds so cool. Nothing yeah. like that happened when I was a teenager. <laughs> I, know, I mean I'm amazing. appalling at drawing, but <laughs> That sounds awesome. Yeah. And there's another one which is um, dynamic life drawing, which sounds quite exciting as well. Yeah. Which is so it's not just a, a model sitting there; it's someone who I think will be moving around, and you can draw them moving around as well. Also, oh, capture so, movement. Yeah, yeah. I love that stuff. No, you know, just you have snapshot memories from school. Yeah. Things. I remember once in an art lesson, a teacher came in, and we were all terrified of her, and she put a chair in the middle of a room, and she made a stand around the chair. <laughs> And she gave us all pieces of paper and some charcoal and said, don't draw the chair. Draw everything oh, around right. the chair. That's interesting. So she was like, I think trying to it teach us about absence and the lack of yeah, this. But yeah. obviously at the time I was like, that's really stupid. Yeah. <laughs> but now I love that because I love thinking about that in terms of poetry and gaps and what's not said. Absolutely. And it's so yeah. fun. But yeah. yeah, my little brain at that time was just like, <laughs> how can I draw something without drawing something? It's really silly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, was, you always got asked to do... Um, sort of strange exercises at school or college and you'd kind of at the time think why am I doing this yeah but some <laughs> so of them bit, stick yeah. with you yeah they yeah. do I love that and yeah. I think it's that kind of thing isn't it once you're out of education you want to learn again because yeah. you realize how valuable that is but I love the exhibition that you guys have gotten at the moment yes. um which is 100 women through comics the exhibition is fantastic I've been around it well twice now um but I think it's also really it's it's important to showcase um women in comics and in graphic novels because it is such a male dominated um sphere and I think that that's changing quite a yeah. lot and being challenged quite a lot but some of the stuff that has gone on in the past where women have been really outspoken against norms and, and looking at it and being faced with that in chronological order yeah. in a gallery yeah. is moving 
and also hilarious because some of the yes, stuff definitely. is so funny. <laughs> can you um, tell us about what people can expect when they come to the exhibition and perhaps some of your favourite artists? Yeah, that are in sure. Here? Um, I th- well, it is an amazing exhibition, and yeah. if you hadn't asked which one was my favourite previously, I'd probably say this one actually, okay. because it's the one that I've probably learned the most from, and um, I found it really inspiring mm-hmm. as well. So it's a hundred, um, as you said, female comic artists, and it goes starting from kind of seventeenth century onwards to the present day, mm. and it shows it demonstrates the breadth of work that women are making and have been making over a really long period of time which has just not really been recognized by the wider public and even the comic world itself because like you say it's people generally think comics are you know superman yeah marvel all of that kind of thing done by men yeah generally about men with who are the superheroes with their kind of women and straight white men well. absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah not much diversity so this is this is kind of different it's uh, 100 women artists and they're telling stories and the thing that i think is really important about it is sometimes when i've said to people oh we've got this amazing exhibition on it's 100 uh women comic artists and they kind of look a bit like oh it's going to be women-y and about women stuff and shoes and boobs and vaginas yeah, oh yeah, my yeah. god <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is I was thinking that's it's, it's not like that at all it's just really good stories mm-hmm. which happen to have been created by women artists yeah and so it's almost that's almost not the point. It's just the fact that no one's no one's noticed yeah. that these and these these stories haven't been given the recognition that they maybe should have done. But also that knee jerk reaction of oh my god, it's about vaginas or whatever. Even if it was like so yeah. focused, yeah, on, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. okay too. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> that's bit, yeah. So who are your favourites or, or your favourite stories? Even if it's not your favourite drawings. Yeah. Um, uh, I think probably well the the one that makes me laugh the most mm-hmm. is uh, Liz Lunny, and she does very very simple drawings, line drawings of this kind of cat character amongst others, and at first you think they're these quite simplistic cartoons, but actually they're dealing with really big things like the meaning of life, but in a really humorous way. Um, or she just kind of uh, the example that's up in the exhibition at the moment it's just something she remembers from her childhood which was an awkward moment at school and even though I've seen it several times over I still laugh out loud every time I look at it and yeah. I think it's brilliant it's just what really is the good. moment from her to, what is that moment it's, um, it's, it's a kind of awful story she's at school and a teacher comes in with another pupil because um, this pupil's mother has died so it's a very serious moment and she's come in with this girl so, you know, we need to be really supportive. But then just at that moment, someone's got a Darth Vader pen. And then it starts talking. And I think it's saying something like, um, we want them alive, just repeatedly. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so it's kind of the worst thing you could possibly say at that moment anyway. Yeah. Um, and then she goes on to say that whenever she's in some situation where someone's delivering some really serious news, that's that quote think comes into <laughs> And then that just yeah. makes you laugh. That's yeah. terrible. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, if you were in those situations, it's probably not the time where you're like, I'm really sorry, I know that I'm not reacting to this properly. It's because of this story, exactly. but also not yeah. appropriate to tell that story yeah, at that yeah. period of time. <laughs> um, one of the ones that I really like is... Um, it's Tarpe Mills, uh, which says, I'm just reading the bit that is next to her comic strip, which yeah. says, American artist June Tarpe Mills created the first costumed action heroine in comics. Miss Fury was the secret identity of a socialite, Marla Drake, who by night wore a panther skin and fought villains, including her swastika-branded nemesis. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Very kick-ass. Yeah. And she said... Um, Mill signed the strip with her middle name to conceal her gender. It would have been a major letdown to the kids if they found out that the author of such virile and awesome characters was a gal. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it, that. Which is both funny but also equally very sad and tragic at the yeah, same time. Yeah. That that she acknowledges that it would disappoint them, so she's saving them and let exactly. them letting them live yeah. in this th- this false world for a bit longer. I, yeah. I mean, actually, I, I was thinking about this earlier. Because there's there's a, a couple more um, people in the exhibition who've like there's someone who's called herself Fish. So oh, I like that fish. yeah, so yeah. like no, and that was I think uh, she was working, in I think the twenties and thirties. Um, but yeah, there's there's a several examples of that, and I was thinking, what like why? What was so bad about the fact it was a woman doing it? Yeah, and was it because the subject of what they're writing about or drawing is not what the kind of ideal of a of a woman is? Mm. 
at that time, maybe even now as well, kind of not allowed to talk about certain things or seem, um, I don't know, sweary or you know, and all of that kind of stuff. You've got to be more quote unquote you can't see I'm doing the air quotes yeah. feminine <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah yeah and all that bollocks well there's yeah. you've, but also I guess there's also that degree of a lot of these uh, the exhibition the, well, the, the art the work that you're showing is very personal yeah and maybe it's also to create a distance between them and the story that they're telling of it's quite a harrowing story yeah so yeah. we've got the um, Becoming Unbecoming yes. by Una do, do we know who Una is because it is just one name there's nothing in the bio yeah. at the back no. as to who she is um, but that's about um women and victim blaming um, and yeah. it seems maybe to create that distance is because you're made to feel ashamed by talking about these things yeah definitely mm. and there's 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 lots of um of the stories which do talk about stuff that um you sort of, you would feel you need a bit of a distance to be able to talk about especially if it's affected you personally yeah and i suppose also if you um have an almost anonymous author by just calling her una it shows that that story is applicable to everybody, maybe. It yeah, can be owned by yeah. everyone because it is a story of, of women in general and how women can be shamed into feeling certain ways. So it's not just her story, it's yeah. everyone else's, even yeah. though she's being the mouthpiece for it. Um, what artists do you have in this exhibition from outside of the UK? first one I'll say is um, Charlotte Salomon, who mm. was um, from Germany. And she's really interesting to pick out because her style of uh, illustration and comics is not at all what you would normally expect. It's not kind of the panel drawings, and it's very, very painterly as well. Mm. And I think it she did, I could be wrong, it's like thousands of pictures, which is essentially autobiographical, and she was in Germany at the time of you know, Hitler, and she was Jewish, so very kind of harrowing time. Mm. But the style that she's used portrays that. So you can look at one of these panels displayed in the exhibition, you don't really need to read the panel about her history or her story and you can just see the way that the paint is used there's something very harrowing and dramatic about it and you just kind of think whoever's done this they've been, they've been through some stuff mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of that that kind of thing yeah um so yeah so there's her um there's also uh jackie orms who's uh, african-american and the other reason i really like her thing although it was done decades ago it's still incredibly relevant. I mean, it's addressing issues just by the fact that she was an African-American woman doing a comic, you know, racism, sexism. Mm. Um, but then there's part of her, the story in the uh, panel that's shown, which is about pollution and this factory kind of polluting the environment. Mm. And you think this is, I think it was the yeah, 1950s. One of the panels in the exhibition that you've got is by Marion Fiol, I think that's how you say her name, um, and she has done um, a series of illustrations called The Collector, um, which I love, they're wordless, yeah. like a silent picture book, um, where this man is sitting on a bench and he's alone and he's sad, so he decides to go into different situations, walk along and pick out aspects of other people's yeah. lives and assemble them to make a photograph for his own life yeah. that he can show yeah. to people. I think that's really creepy and wonderful. <laughs> it is, it's brilliant, because when you first start looking at it, at first you think, oh, it's just this guy, he's jealous because he's on his own and a couple's walk past. And then it kind of changes and you think, hang on a second, these aren't the same people now that he's kind of stealing things from. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on? And yeah. it's only when you reach the last panel and you see him with his camera you go, oh, <laughs> he's done, he's set up his, his, like, fake family life from other people's yeah. lives. Yeah. yeah, and it's so true, yeah. especially in the age of social media, that um, what you can see from your friends on Facebook of what their lives is, is just, yeah. just what they've chosen to show you, yeah. and how we yeah. can all orchestrate what people see of us a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, obviously on probably a smaller a smaller scale than what yeah. he's doing. <laughs> yeah. Don't go around nicking things from other people or nicking people <laughs> yeah, yeah. from itself. People, non- they ask me, you know, I've never read graphic novels. So where do I start? Yeah, I always, I always point them towards Persepolis. That that, that yeah. is, I think, yeah. and I'm not sure if that's just because that's the first graphic novel I ever read. Yeah, but Persepolis by Margin Set Rapey is about her living in Iran during the Islamic Revolution, and it is re- like reading her autobiography. Yeah, but there's just something about the way she draws and the style of it that is so um, affecting, I think. Um, And I just think it's absolutely brilliant. 
it's re- it's interesting you said that's the first one that kind of got you into it because similar um, mm. thing for me really although I saw it as a film first I saw the film first yeah. too actually that yeah. is true I did yeah. see the film first um, and I just really liked the film and thought it was amazing and then really quickly afterwards realised oh it's come from a book yeah. and then that made me want to look at the book and then yeah and then go from there this exhibition has really like if anyone is thinking oh, I don't really know anything about comics this isn't going to be interesting to me I would say just go anyway go. because you'll change your mind I'm sure of it I'm yeah. sure of it too there's such a wide range of different styles and different stories that yeah. are being told there's something there for everyone yeah definitely. absolutely and if people so this exhibition is running until May the 15th yeah that's right um, yeah. but if people aren't in London and are further afield there is actually a digital booklet they can download there from is, there yeah. so if you google House of Illustration 100 Women Comics then you will find the page um, and there is a, a, yeah, a book that um, you can download it's sequential is the name of the app and okay. then once you've downloaded that, you can download the House of Illustration bit for free. For free, there you go. <laughs> and you can have a look at the exhibition yourself Yeah, at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you should definitely do that. And if you do happen to be in London before the 15th of May, you should come. Thanks very much, Holly. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that you guys enjoyed this episode of the podcast. If you would like to leave me suggestions for future episodes of Books with Jen and things that you would like to see, you can either leave me a comment on YouTube, tweet me at Aeroplane Girl, or drop me an email at jenvcampbell at gmail.com. In the meantime, between now and the next episode of the podcast, I'll be uploading lots of videos about books on my YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com forward slash jenvcampbell. I hope you guys are having a great week and I'll speak to you very soon. Lots of bookish love. Bye.